Hi, my name is Doris Vitak, and today we're going to be doing a run-through of early United States government from the Articles of Confederation to the Constitution. And when I say run-through, I mean run, run. So if at any time I start speaking too fast, feel free to hit pause. So we start our story with the end of the Revolutionary War. In case you didn't know, newsflash, we did win. Uh, we managed to get through the war with enough organization using a document called the Articles of Confederation. Now, the Articles of Confederation basically stated that the states were banded together, that they were a confederation, and laid out some of the things that government could do. But the problem was the Article of Confeder Articles of Confederation sort of sucked. They had a lot of shortcomings. One of the big ones was a lack of unity. When you think about it, we take a we take the fact that we're Americans for granted quite a bit. When you go to a foreign country, say you're in England, and somebody asks you, so where are you from? What do you say? Do you say, I'm from Washington, I'm from New York, I'm from Delaware? No, you probably start with, I'm an American, unless you're really ashamed of yourself, uh, which you probably should be, but you generally start with your nation. But at this time, the United States wasn't this big, strong, um, together nation that we think of it today, it was this fractured group of states. Someone, if you ask them where they were from, would usually say something like, I'm from Maryland, I'm from New Jersey, I'm from New York. Affiliation with your state was stronger than affiliation with your country. So this lack of unity caused a lot of problems. One of the big ones was that each state would probably make its own money. So Maryland would have one kind of coin, and New Jersey would have another, and New York would have another. And this led to huge problems. Just think of how much of a hassle traveling between states would be. If every single time you had to get a different form of money, you had to be familiar with the new rules of where you were going because laws could be different in one state than another. So that would be a huge hassle. And then, for people who wanted to be involved in trading, some of these states would um, really hold out for people in their own state, and there would be these kind of interstate trading wars, where if you were in Maryland, then maybe you'd get a good deal on trading inside of Maryland, but not so much New Jersey. So huge problems with this lack of unity, lack of togetherness. Not to mention that there was limited executive power. That meant that there wasn't one head honcho in charge. It was very convoluted. Countless committees had to be held to deal with things. As a great example of this, John Adams, who we know is our second president, during the Confederation times, he was at one point on 80 different committees, 80 different committees, just in order to get things done. So we have our lack of unity, our limited executive power, and countless committees. And then there's a third thing. The Articles of Confederation required unanimous state approval to any amendments to the Articles of the Confederation. You would have to get every single state to agree to make any change. If you think, well, shouldn't that be the way that it is, all democratic and stuff? Well, imagine that you have a family, and the mom says, hey, let's go to the restaurant, and the dad agrees, and your two little siblings agree, but your older sister is always the holdout. She's saying, I don't want to go anywhere with my family. It's no fun to hang out with mom and dad. That's just, like, so not cool. So she's the only person who doesn't want to go. Well, now imagine that instead of dragging her off to the car and forcing her to come to the restaurant with you, as might usually happen, you had to wait until she could either be convinced or you would have to give up the idea of going altogether. That is what a hassle unanimous state approval would be for the Articles of Confederation. Getting everyone to agree is kind of like trying to get squabbling siblings to come over to your side. Not going to happen. Then, there were economic troubles. You know how I mentioned earlier that all the states were making their own money? Well, add on to that crazy inflation and prices not being very stable and people looking for work. So economic troubles were huge during Confederation times after the Revolutionary War. Lack of unity, limited executive power, and countless committees required unanimous state approval and economic troubles yeah, basically, if you need a thesis statement for an, a paper about the Articles of Confederation, I think you can pretty safely argue the Articles of Confederation kind of sucked. However, it did manage to get some stuff done. You may have heard of the Land Ordinance of 1785. Uh, the Land Ordinance of 1785, if you're wondering about the paper we are drawing at the top here, 
This is my version of an airplane window. If you've ever been on an airplane and if you notice, hey, look, it's weirdly in these little grids. Um, part of that might be due to if you're close enough to different cities layouts, but the rectilinear grid that we see when we're looking out of our airplane window also has a lot to do with the Land Ordinance of 1785. The Land Ordinance of 1785 set out uh, rules and ideas for surveying and selling state land. So it was a huge um, expansion, and so these townships would be built or surveyed, and um, they're the squares that you see when you look out of your window. Land Ordinance of 1785. And there was the Northwest Ordinance. The Northwest Ordinance was basically saying to, if you want it to be a state, you have to go through some proving first. Because at this time, people were scrambling to eat up land. Uh, there were new states being made, other states claiming ownership over pieces of land, and it was kind of getting out of control. So in 1787, 1787, 1787, petition works, right? In 1787, this Northwest Ordinance said, hey, before you can become a state, you have to be a territory. And while you're a territory, you have to be ruled by these people who are selected by Congress. And once you have 5,000 male adults, then you can apply to become new kind of territory. And after you have, I think, 60,000 people, you can become a state. So it was basically saying you can't just automatically become a state. You have to go through step by step. But the point was, even with cool things like Northwest Ordinance, the Land Ordinance of 1785, the Articles of Confederation mostly sucked. They were very annoying and hard to deal with, so finally people had enough with the annoyingness of the Articles of the Confederation. There's a reason that we say things are constitutional and not confederational, because, da -da 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 -da, drum roll, imaginary, the Constitution came about. Well, it wasn't just gloriously born out of the earth. The Constitution required blood, sweat, and tears. And if you think that the Founding Fathers were a sedate group who just sat around and discussed high and mighty issues of politics and history and never argued with each other, that is not true. For all their wisdom and uh, great ideas, the Founding Fathers argued a lot. And so the Constitution came about uh, as the result of some of these arguments. But not everybody really liked the idea of making a constitution in the first place. Patrick Henry claimed to smell a rat. Yes, his give me liberty or give me death quote was way catchier. But basically what he was saying here was that he felt that the articles, or sorry, that the constitution was some sort of conspiracy and it would take away states' rights, which was, you know, valid concern. In all seriousness, not everyone liked the idea of making federal or central government bigger or stronger, because you could argue the Articles of Confederation, for all of their, at times, ineffectiveness, made sure that the government didn't have a whole lot of power. And this new constitution would give the federal slash central government more power. It's a debate that still continues today. You'll probably hear things like, no more big government. So. The Constitution was in the works, but it was fight time. Okay, yeah, I know the snippy illustration is a little bit superfluous, but, you know, Jersey. New Jersey had a plan, and Virginia had a plan, and they didn't quite line up. New Jersey wanted to keep the existing framework of each state getting equal representation, so each state would get the same number of representatives. They liked the idea of a unicameral Congress. If you don't know what a unicameral congress is, just look at the uni, think of unicycle, and one, that means a one-house congress. Congress would get some new powers, taxes, trade regulation, a supreme court. So, um, a little bit of change, but mostly the same old, same old from the Articles of Confederation. Virginia also had a plan. Virginia wanted three branches of government. This looks a little familiar if you took elementary history. Legislative, executive, and judicial. They wanted the federal government to make laws affecting each citizen and not just states. And the legislative would be divided as well. It would have an upper house and a lower house, which we know as a Senate and House of Representatives. So you can see how these two plans were quite different. New Jersey wanted equal representation based on states, a one-house Congress, and a few new powers for Congress. Virginia wanted three branches of government, the federal government to make laws affecting each citizen, and the, for the legislative to be divided into upper and lower houses. So, what were they to do? Determine congressional representation by state or by population? What do you think? 
if it were up to you, what do you think is more fair? To determine representation by state and realize that, you know, even though California has way more people than Idaho, they're both going to get the same amount of power? Or would you rather determine it by population? And then realize that, oh, whoa, if I live in a state that's not that inhabited, like Montana, then suddenly I don't have as much of a voice? Either way, it seemed like someone was going to get the short end of the stick. Until they came up with the Connecticut Compromise. Woohoo for Connecticut. It's also called the Great Compromise because of how awesome it was. Well, yeah. States got representation based on population in the House of Representatives. That's important to remember. Population determines the House of Representatives. But each state got two senators in the Senate. No matter whether you were big or small, had a lot of people or not very many, you would get the same number of senders. And remember, the senders were more powerful. So population determines the number of representatives you get in the House of Representatives, and you get two senders no matter what. Now, this seemed like an awesome compromise, and the Constitution was going on its way gloriously, but there were still issues to be dealt with. The federal government had to be careful not to give too much power to the people, and we hear that phrase, power to the people, and we think, woohoo, awesome. But not all the founding fathers thought quite the same way. Alexander Hamilton, who was the first secretary of the treasury, founded the National Bank, a lot of people um, think was quite brilliant, once said, the people is a great beast. And remember, this is one of the founding fathers we're talking about, so maybe not so crazy about democracy, eh? There's an even more telling quote, Elbridge Gerry, another founding father, look him up if you haven't heard of him. Most of the nation's problems flow from an excess of democracy. So you can see here that they obviously had some issues with the idea of people getting too much power. But at the same time, they were not wanting to start another monarchy and get overthrown. They didn't want to become a tyranny. So what were they to do? What would you do if you were in this situation? You have to make sure that you don't have an anarchy where the people are in control and there aren't really any laws or central government, but you don't want to take all the control away from your citizens. So, here is their solution. The less powerful House of Representatives satisfied those who wanted the people to have a say in their government. Each representative had two years, and this meant that the representatives had better listen pretty closely to people, otherwise they might get voted out. So they had to listen um, to people and represent them. Now, on the other hand, the more powerful Senate satisfied those who were worried the masses would gain too much power over government, leading to anarchy. And one of the reasons behind such concerns, if you've ever seen the president's approval rating, how they go up, they go down with every passing day, you know that the way that we think of politics, that our political views can change on a whim. So the Senate was designed to be more immune to these changing political tides. Senators had staggered terms of six years, which meant that you wouldn't have all the senators being voted in at the same time, and it meant that uh, they would be able to make decisions perhaps in more, uh, perhaps more wisely was the idea than the representatives who had to listen very closely to their constituents or risk getting voted out. So the House of Representatives was designed to be closer to the people and the more powerful Senate a little more detached. But this brought up another important concern. Wait a second, what if one branch suddenly gets way more power than the other? And you might think that's not a very valid concern, but if you look at world history and you look at countries that have had you know, a great government, well suddenly one person or one branch might have taken control. Dictators will take control, the military might take control, um, I don't think I've ever really heard of a legislative branch taking control, but you know what could happen. So the separation of powers ensured that no one branch or one person would take control. Powers were separated. The legislative did their thing, the president did his or her thing, um, his thing, because they were sexist at that time, and, <laughs> well, um, the separation of powers made sure that each person did their own thing and that if they didn't, the other branch would be there to check them. So checks and balances. Power was balanced, and one branch would check another if things were getting out of hand. That was all designed to ensure that the United States would not turn into another monarchy, just like the British that they had worked so hard to get themselves free of. 
But not everyone was quite so convinced. Even after the Constitution was written and uh, edited and everything, they had to fight for ratification. They had to fight to get it accepted and approved. There were two sides, the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists. The Federalists, as you can tell from the title, were big fans of federal government. They wanted more power to national central government. And they also, obviously, were big fans of the Constitution because it gave the national government unprecedented powers that hadn't been seen in the Articles of Confederation. People like Alexander Hamilton were big-time Federalists. They were um, basically trying to convince the Anti-Federalists, hey, the Constitution isn't all that bad. The Anti-Federalists had concerns of their own. Remember Patrick Henry smelling a rat? Well, the Anti-Federalists were worried that the Constitution was just turning the United States into a tyranny, that all this power in the federal government wasn't good for states' rights. They wanted less federal government power. So how were the Federalists to convince the Anti-Federalists that this Constitution actually was not such a bad thing? Well, one of the major uh, ways that the Federalists were able to convince the Anti-Federalists was through something called the Federalist Papers. The Federalist Papers, um, which were written, which were co-authored by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, laid out very persuasive cases for the Constitution. Madison famously wrote um, a document which said that no one political faction would be able to take control because uh, the rest of the citizens would prevent it. So this perfect balance of democracy and republic. Now, the Federalists eventually did convince the Anti-Federalists, and in 1788, the Constitution was ratified or approved, and we have the lovely, beautiful Constitution that is still in use today. So if you ever wonder um, how the Constitution came about, it didn't come about from a bunch of people sitting in a room and saying, hey, let's do blank, and that seconded, yes, I agree. It came about through a lot of argument, debate, dissent, and those are some of the uh, best things about it. So, next time your parents are telling you and your sibling to start fighting, maybe you can... Um, use that argument on them. Hey mom, argument and dissent are the best things about America. That's what Adorsky talks says. Well, joking. If you want to find out more about American history, um, the textbook that I've been using for my APUSH class is America and Narrative History by George Brown Tyndall and David Emery Shee. Uh, the website is seen here. You can look that up, copy it in your browser, pause if you need to. And if you want any more videos, including more tutorials about writing, history, what have you, you can always go to my YouTube page, which is youtube.com slash adorasvtalk. I hope that this is helpful. Please do give me comments and feedback. This is the first uh, ever video for um, a push that I've made, and uh, tell me if you think it's too hard, too easy, too fast, too slow, whatever. Don't hold back. Thanks a bunch for watching. Hope you have a great day.